Good morning. Welcome to CMC Markets on Friday, the 4th of June. And this quick look at the week ahead, beginning the 7th of June. Before we get started, uh, a couple of uh, risk warnings. But in my absence, um, European markets haven't really gone too far from when I did, when I last did one of these videos. They traded in a broadly choppy fashion, albeit with a slightly upward bias, while US markets have traded in a fairly tight range, albeit um, below their recent record highs. Um, so there hasn't been what I would call an awful lot of um, an awful lot of volatility. Yeah, we've seen a bit of a choppy range. And while we've seen the DAX and the Stock 600 make new record highs this week, the modest gains that we've seen have been incremental at best as expectations about the speed of an economic re reopening have ebbed and flowed over the past two weeks. So I think as we look at the various indices, it's pretty much business as usual in terms of looking to buy the dip. Though what we have seen, I think, and what has been notable is the fact that European markets are starting to outperform US markets by a fairly small amount. Um, US markets look as if they're going to finish this week slightly lower, while European markets look set to finish the week higher, though the FTSE 100 continues to lag behind its European peers. We are now finally above 7,000, um, and we've managed to hold above 7,000 for the past two to three days, but it's, it's, been, it's been very much a, a stop-start affair. We haven't as yet been able to move above the highs of last month. What has been notable, though, as we look at this trend line on this particular chart here, is the fact that while we have dipped below the trend line on a number of occasions, we've closed well above it. And I think that's important. I think at the moment, the uptrend continues to remain intact. Yes, there are certain parts of the UK economy that are underperforming, but recent economic data has continued to show signs of improvement in May. The, the May PMIs have, have really borne that out in this week's data. The rebound in the UK services sector hit a record high. It's further evidence of a strong UK economic rebound in Q2. However, what it can't do is disguise the fact there are still significant areas of the economy that are continuing to struggle. And it's not hard to see where those, those, those sectors are. It's travel and leisure. Um, particularly airlines, as the, as the UK government continues to wrestle um, with uh, the, um, the rising infection rates in what is now known, I think, is the Delta variant or the old India variant of COVID-19. The fact remains, though, that I think we will see some form of easing on June the 21st. I just don't think it's realistic to expect the whole scale removal of restrictions as has, has been touted for several weeks now. I think we will still see some limited restrictions remain in place. And that's really, I think, what is helping to hinder um, the rebound in airlines and overseas and, and any other companies that I think are really exposed to the overseas travel sector. And that is obviously what is, I think, holding back the FTSE 100 to a greater or lesser extent. Nonetheless, while we remain above the 50-day moving average, I'm still of the opinion that we're likely to finish um, the summer, or probably by the end of this month, see a taking out of these highs in May and head up towards the 7,200 level in due course, as long as we are able to hold above the 7,000 um, or the 50-day moving average around about 6,950. We're also waiting on today's non-farm payrolls numbers, which as of yet, I don't have sight of. Um, I think they could be, a, but I think they're likely to be a fairly short-term arbiter of volatility, but I certainly don't think that they are likely to affect the overall direction of equity markets going forward. Um, the big headline for non-farm payrolls is um, job gains of around about 660,000 in the wake of a very strong ADP payrolls report yesterday. I think anyone who thinks that there is a correlation between ADP and non-farms, I think really needs to get out more. And um, they haven't correlated for quite some time and they're not likely to going forward. Um, ultimately, I think the numbers 
are probably meaningless in the overall scheme of things. So, so what does that mean, I think, overall for US Treasury yields? Well, let's have a quick look back at last month's payrolls report, because if we look back at last month's payrolls report and the reaction that we saw to that huge miss of 255,000, we were expecting a number of around about 1 million, that was the reaction of the US bond market to that miss. We spiked lower, it's around about 145, 1.45, but soon recovered that equilibrium fairly quickly. And I think when we're talking about the, the, the May payrolls report, I think what we need to put into perspective is the fact that while jobs growth is probably not likely to be as strong as maybe first anticipated as we headed into the, as we head into the summer it doesn't change the fact that the US economy is still likely to grow quite significantly over the course of the next few months um, and one of the reasons why that why the the US um, labor market is probably going to take longer to recover is simply on the basis that um, the unemployment benefits that are currently as which were currently brought in as part of the March stimulus package aren't due to expire until September. Um, and these unemployment benefits are likely to continue to act as a break on rehiring levels in the US labor market at a time when vacancies are already at record levels of around 8 million. Now, um, if you're getting paid more to claim unemployment benefit than to go back to the labor market, you're not going to go back to the labor market. Now, that in itself could cause an inflation surge in terms of wages. Now that in the short term is likely to be a good thing for employees. And I think the only concern I would have about rising inflation expectations um, is if it becomes um, more entrenched. Now at the moment, there are no signs of that happening. An awful lot of the reason you're seeing rising inflation expectations, it's largely been driven by the rebound in oil prices. You've only got to look at Brent crude prices and where they are now and where they were a year ago. Now, yes, there are supply chain um, capacity constraints which are likely to feed through into the headline numbers. And certainly agricultural commodity prices are also rising um, quite significantly at, and are at multi-month and multi-year highs. But I think the key thing for me is that while consumers have additional disposable income, there shouldn't be a significant uptick in inflationary pressure in the short to medium term. Now that's gonna be key, particularly next week when we get a good look at US CPI numbers for May. Now, you know, we're talking about next week and we're talking about the key items that I'm keeping a particular eye out for next week. US CPI is going to be one of those numbers that's going to be of a particular interest, but also we've got the European Central Bank rate meeting. The here and now, US yields aren't going anywhere. They currently look toppy around about 1.7%. They currently look well supported around about 1.5. None of the numbers that we are likely to see over the course of the next week or so are likely to change that. And that should keep the risk profile or the risk premium for equity markets pointing towards the upside, pointing towards buying dips in the overall scheme of things. So if we look at, say, for example, the Germany 30, we can also see here that we have continued to edge higher over the course of the past few days. So I expect that trend to continue. The only concern that I do have when it comes to equity markets in general is the NASDAQ. Now, two weeks ago, I talked about this level here of around about 13,760 there or thereabouts. That has continued to cap every single rebound. And it also happens to coincide with this series of lows all the way through here. Okay, we've got a little bit of an overspill there, but ultimately there does appear to be a bit of a barrier around about 13,800 when it comes to the NASDAQ. And I think that could be why US markets are starting to underperform relative to the outperformance that we're seeing in European markets. We're also seeing it less so in the S&P as well. We can see the record high back here, 10th of May. Um, we've had a brief look towards the upside on Tuesday this week. Weren't able to sustain those gains and start to roll back over. 
So I think we could start to see continued divergence between US markets and European markets. Now, you know, I could be slightly wrong on that, but ultimately I think European markets probably um, are cheaper on a relative valuation than in US markets. So there's potential for slightly more upside there. We've also seen a bit of a rebound in the US dollar over the course of the past few days. Well, actually the past 24 hours, if truth be told. And a large part of that was as a result of the fairly decent ISM numbers that we saw um, out of May, but also the fairly decent payrolls report um, from ADP. Now, the big question is, is whether or not that's sustainable. I think US CPI could have a good part to play in that. That's due out on the 10th of June. And with the Fed meeting a week after um, the, the following week, um, certainly Fed policymakers have been making noise about modest tapering. Now, that's nothing to fear. There is nothing to fear from a moderate ta modest tapering of asset purchases. The Fed is currently buying $100 billion a month in uh, US treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. They don't really need to be doing that now. They can really afford to start pairing that monthly amount back quite substantially without undermining the overall recovery in the US economy. We've already got the Biden administration talking about changing um, changing tax um, levels. We've also got them talking about another stimulus plan. Ultimately, the, the Federal Reserve can afford to start thinking about tapering its asset purchase program. And they're likely to start preparing the ground for that in the meeting in two weeks time. But let's talk about US CPI because last month markets got a little spooked when US CPI jumped sharply to 4.2 percent. Now that was well ahead of expectations of 3.6 percent and the highest level since September 2008. Core prices also rose to 3 percent. Now a big component of the increase was a big rise in used car and truck prices which rose 10 percent as well as increased energy costs. In the aftermath of this number as well as a big rise in PPI prices there's been much debate as to how much of this will drop out of the numbers and thus be transitory. Now, if the recent April PPI numbers are any guide, we could see well an even we could well see an even higher number, given how much PPI tends to be a leading indicator for CPI. So, as a reminder, April PPI jumped to 6.2%, its highest annual level in over 10 years, as prices in the goods index saw increases of 18.4%. That's 18.4. Now, that includes some dairy, meats as well as plastics and other materials. So that's likely to create a trickle down effect or a trickle up effect in CPI. Now, market expectations for, for, a rise of 4 .6, for it to rise to 4.6%, I wouldn't be surprised to see it go to 5 or even 6% in the coming months on an annualized basis. It's important, it's in an annualized basis. Core CPI, which ex excludes food and energy, is also expected to rise further to around about 3.5%, 3.6%. Again, um, this is entirely expected given the base effects that we saw from a year ago. The big question is, will these, these, these factors continue into the end of the year? And I think that's the big unknown. And we're not really going to know that for at least three to six months. For, for the here and now, bond markets appear quite sanguine about it. Certainly, if you look at the 10-year, hasn't really moved that much. If it comes in well above expectations, we could see a spike up to 1.7%. Um, but again, it's really about how central banks manage the expectations around that. So the US dollar looks as if it's on the cusp of a significant rebound. Certainly, that is good news for euro dollar um, because I certainly think over the course of the past few weeks um, the, U the ECB has been concerned about the rise in the euro. I don't think they need to be so worried about it now. I think the dollar is about to make a bit of a comeback. People have been writing off the dollar for years and they will continue to write the dollar off um, but ultimately what else is there? Euro? Please don't make me laugh. Um, the Chinese from NIMBY it's not liquid enough. Ultimately in the absence of another reserve currency, the US dollar is still going to be the go-to currency um, if you're looking at a potential haven trade. The euro at the moment is still 
got significant um, obstacles to being what I would call a proper reserve currency or a proper alternative to the US dollar. So we've got an ECB rate meeting this week. It's likely to prove an interesting one given the recent rise in long-term yields that we've seen in not only um, German bonds but also Italian, Spanish and other 10-year um, yields because they've risen quite substantially, um, particularly in the case of Italy where we seen we saw an initial move above 1% in the 10-year um, before sliding back. Now this may not seem a lot, you know, a 1% yield or a 0.9% yield on Italian 10-year debt um, may not seem that much. Um, but when you compare it to German debt, which is minus 0.2%, that's still a big gap. And ultimately, um, when you have a debt to GDP ratio in excess of 150%, it soon becomes a financing problem if those yields continue to go higher. Now, they have slipped back. And I think really how Christine Lagarde and the ECB manage expectations about their own support programme will be key in whether or not those yields start to edge back up again. The ECB has got a bit of a problem given the fact that we're seeing rises in headline inflation. Um, and that is making some northern countries a little bit uneasy about the, the, the largesse, if you like, of the ECB's current asset purchase program. There's been rising um, chatter, if you like, jibber jabber, whatever you want to call it, um, about the risks in the ECB um, managing its asset purchase program and certainly the monetary policy hawks are going to be getting a little bit louder when it comes to scaling back the levels of support particularly now there appears to be some movement on the pandemic recovery fund disbursements which could well start to get trickled out over the course of the next few weeks and months assuming that all of the ratification program or process goes according to plan. So some of the ECB's problems are outside of its control, namely rising US yields. But the, for the here and now, the central bank doves need to convince the hawks that now is not the time to start signaling a change of stance and pushing and putting upward pressure on um, long-term long-term yields in the periphery. At the moment, we do appear to have topped out in euro dollar. Certainly on the basis of this chart, there does appear to be a little bit of a reversal taking place. And I think over the course of the next few days, we could well see a retest of this 12070 area and this 12050 area, given the fact that we look as if we're going to be posting a bearish weekly reversal on the Japanese candlestick chart as a result of the rebound in the dollar. So what does that mean for the pound? Well, the pound, once again, has retested those 142 highs that I identified in a video two weeks ago. And it's nice to see that that 142.40 level has been respected. We've got a couple of data points out of the UK next week. We've got UK GDP for April. Um, certainly the most recent economic data out of the UK saw the UK economy enjoy a decent into the first quarter with an expansion of 2.1% for March GDP. Um, overall, the economy only contracted 1.5%. The further easing of restrictions on April the 12th with the very strong PMIs that we saw from there and the consequent even stronger PMIs that we've seen in April would appear to suggest that April GDP is likely to be even stronger than March. So we could see a number of 25 or 3% and may even stronger than that. The big support level on cable at the moment it does appear to be around about 140.80. That's these, this, this, the low here and the low from Thursday. And if you actually draw a horizontal line through there, you can see there's a decent area of support through there. Ultimately, we still remain in the uptrend that I've drawn in from these two lines here and also the 50 day moving average. So for me, sterling remains very much by the dip trade, certainly in against the dollar and certainly also against the euro and you know i've remained consistent in that while we remain below this resistance level of 8730 we're in a bit of a range at the moment we're near the bottom of the range on the 
a downside around about 85.60, but I still maintain that we should see a return back to the levels that we saw in early April of around about 84.70 in the short to medium term going forward. We've also got UK manufacturing and industrial production for April on the 11th, along with UK April GDP. And we're expecting to see um, expansion of 2% in the April numbers, building on the gains that we saw in March as the economy continues to reopen and restrictions continue to get eased. So those are the key, those are the key economic indicators for the week beginning the 7th of Jan. So to recap that, we've got ECB rate meeting on the 10th of June, US CPI for May on the 10th of June, UK GDP and UK manufacturing production, industrial production on the 11th of June. In terms of company announcements, we've got GameStop, which has been pushed back in to, onto the 9th of June, uh, a meme stock, or we've already seen significant volatility in AMC Entertainment. Um, for me, GameStop still remains very much a lottery when it comes to uh, trading this particular market, but you can read about my thoughts on GameStop on the website under the news and analysis section. We've also got an interesting company called ITM Power. Um, this was picked out um, by one of the digital um, marketing people for me to have a look at. And it's an interesting renewable energy play. Um, we've seen an awful lot of attention put on renewable energy um, companies. And this is one such company. In 2015, ITM signed a deal with Royal Dutch Shell for hydrogen refueling stations for cars, a deal, with, a deal that was extended to include buses, trains and ships. Now, ITM also developed solutions to capture surplus renewable energy by the development of battery technology to store renewable energy using rapid response electrolyzers to store as well as release energy when there are peaks and troughs in wind power. Now, the shares saw a big sell off at the beginning of this year. And one of the reasons for that was the fact that the company posted first half numbers, which were disappointing to say the least. First half revenues fell 92% to £200,000. Now, while some of that was probably due to COVID-19 disruptions, losses also increased to £10.4 million. Pounds. Now, the key test, I think, for this week is whether what's been announced in the second half will allay concerns over the outlook moving forward. The company is looking to meet revenue targets to project annual revenues of £29.1 million by 2022. Now, that's a sizable jump from the record number that we saw pre-pandemic of 4.6 million in 2019. So it's projected annual revenues, okay, of £29.1 million. There's a record number of £4.6 million in 2019. First half revenues were £200,000. So you can see that there's been a significant readjustment in investor expectations about this company. And currently it's trading below the 200 day moving average and struggling to get back above it. So those numbers should be very interesting when they are released on the 10th of June. We've also got British American Tobacco on the 9th of June. And they've been under pressure in recent months and uh, days because of proposed um, US considering legislation to cut the amount of nicotine, nicotine even, in cigarettes to levels that are considered less addictive, which sort of rather defeats the object of having uh, nicotine because that's the whole point, isn't it? Um, that's a feature, not a bug, if you like. Um, we've also got Brown Foreman's first fourth quarter earnings, that's the maker of Jack Daniels, on the 9th of June. And we've also got the Worldwide Developers Conference for Apple starting on Monday. Now, Apple's particularly interesting, I think, because if you look at this trend line that I've drawn in here, we're also on the 200-day moving average, and we're flirting with the trend line support. So this $120 level is likely to be a very, very key support level over the course of the next few days, because these tech stocks do appear to be starting to lose a little bit of momentum. And what is this I see before me? Is this a potential head and shoulders reversal for Apple? Could we see a move back down 
below $100 on a break below this level here. So this 120 level is, I think is going to be very, very important in the overall scheme of things as we look ahead to the next few days and the next few weeks. So um, to sum up, I think that's pretty much um, I think that's pretty much it for uh, this week's preview. Um, I've now tried to get through a lot um, after an absence of um, a week or so, um, but um, hopefully, um, hopefully uh, I've uh, shed some light on uh, some of the things that I'm keeping an eye out for over the course of the next few days. And hopefully the non-farm payrolls later this afternoon won't show, won't um, throw too much of a spanner into the cogs of the market. But until next week, thank you very much for listening. This is Michael Hewson talking to you from CMC Markets.